Hi, I'm Aviva Vadia. Uh, welcome. If you're here today, you or stakeholders that impact you are not probably not happy with the status quo around platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. The audience today contains people from those platforms, policymakers, civil society, researchers. We'll be exploring a new way to approach both recommendation systems that are used by such platforms, and perhaps even the way that those platforms determine what their recommendation systems should do. More generally, platform governance. I'll be joined today by two wonderful experts. We have Jeff Allen from the Integrity Institute, uh, formerly Facebook. Um, and we have uh, Claudia Schwalis, who will provide context from her work for the OECD on some incredible new democratic innovations, like a whole new paradigm. And she's helped design systems which are helping govern Paris right now. Of course, the slide changing is, oh, there we go. So I wanna to start today with just a teaser slide showing you a summary of what I hope you're gonna take away from this session. This work is motivated by what I think are two of the most critical questions of our time. First, what kinds of behavior are and should be incentivized by platforms like Facebook and TikTok? In other words, what is rewarded? And second, with a nod to Shoshana Zuboff, how should such decisions be made? In other words, who decides? So the primary goal today is to introduce bridging recommendations and platform democracy. They're just steps toward answers to those key questions. I don't expect you to believe that they're silver bullet solutions to the problems that I'm gonna lay out, because they aren't. My purpose is just to add new powerful tools to our tool chest. We're gonna need every tool we can find if we're gonna to get to a world where our information ecosystem truly serves democracy. And nothing I'm gonna to share today is gonna to be truly novel, except perhaps for some terminology. That to me makes it even more powerful. It's all built on a foundation that we know works for other disciplines and environments and just hasn't been applied as much as it should be to our technology yet. This is just now starting to happen and we need to turbocharge it. So I also intend to leave you with some action items, things that we can do to accelerate these promising early developments. And if you fall into any of these, I'll be delighted to help you execute on those next steps. Finally, I want to help you annoy people at technology and policy cocktail parties. And so the next time that someone at such a party says, algorithmic recommendations push people to extremes, you're going to be able to respond with, well, actually, bridging recommendations can help prevent that. And if someone at a party says, oh, it's either governments or platforms in charge of our speech and neither should be trusted, you can respond with, well, actually, what about platform democracy? So with that, a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, first, this is being recorded. Secondly, put your questions into the Zoom Q&A system. Um, also, feel free to share relevant information and links in the chat for others. Can't guarantee seeing them till afterward, but I'm going to have some help in, in sort of navigating through those. Um, and you can find links at newsletter.aviv.me, which sort of has at least the overviews of some of what we're going to be discussing, though the longer reports are not, not out yet. And you can think of this agenda here as a sort of like almost like a mini conference with two interconnected mini presentations two short fireside chats, and then an open panel Q&A. So why are we here? So the platform status quo is potentially incompatible with democracy. It foments instability, deteriorates trust, it magnifies division. This makes cooperation with and across nations really, really difficult, even as it becomes even more important due to the global crises from climate change to pandemics. And this is gonna get much, much worse. I'm not gonna get into details of why it's gonna get worse today, beyond just saying that there's a lot of really hard work that has bought us some time, time before AI advances truly ravage our information environment. We need to use that time wisely to build systems that are gonna shore up our democracies 
in the face of tools of persuasion and synthesis that are the stuff of nightmares. My guiding North Star in all of this is that our social technologies have to facilitate understanding, trust, and wise decision-making. They aren't up to that right now, and we need to fix it before it's too late. Oops. So I'm gonna be exploring two interconnected solutions, right? Introducing bridging recommendations and platform democracy. These are distinct approaches. They solve different problems, but they're interrelated and that they both may be critical in order to address that underlying motivation. Platforms compatible with democracy. So let's dive into the first piece of this. Algorithmic recommendations and the potential of bridging based ranking. Better answers to this question of what is rewarded. So the context here is that recommendation systems are incredibly important. We're producing trillions of gigabytes of data each year. We need to allocate our attention among all the, that giant mass of data. And so these recommendation systems are everywhere. When you open up any of your browsers, when you turn on your phone, like everything that you're using has within it recommender systems, recommendation systems, not just you know, your social media platforms. You know, Open up a news provider, same thing. So these recommendation systems determine what is rewarded and that attention is what translates into money, power, and status. And so in, in effect, these recommender systems, they define this reward structure for society itself. And this gets to the problem. They don't currently reward what we might want them to reward. They reward sort of conflict creators, what Amanda Ripley calls conflict entrepreneurs and people who are like, arguing for us versus them conflict in order to gain money, power, and status. That probably isn't super helpful. And this problem starts supply side. It influences what kinds of content people make in order to gain an audience. That means politicians, journalists, entertainers, Hollywood influencers, everyday people, just like posting. It influences what is even created. And then that entrenches demand for even more conflict inciting content. And you can see some of the real extremes of what that happened, what that creates in places like Myanmar, newest insurrection. And it happens at every scale from our local school boards to geopolitics. This isn't just algorithmic amplification, like showing people bad content more. It's a rewiring of the incentive structure around the production of content and around who succeeds in society. People who create conflict are just better capable of succeeding in this environment. And so like, just as an anecdote, I've had reporters ask me like, what evidence I have for this? And like, you know, I can point to papers and they like, there's, there's still like academic disagreement around this and that. But then I ask them to bet that there's, their colleagues aren't changing their reporting due to the incentives of social media. And even if they're part of a, a you know, an august institution that doesn't show them metrics, it still suffuses everything that they do. They don't take that bet. And I don't think a politician is going to take it either. So why should a platform care? Well, besides all the stuff I said earlier, it affects their brand. It scares away advertisers. It hurts engagement in the long run. Sometimes regulators are, you know, pressuring counterproductive things to do instead. And it massively increases moderation costs. Just one provider for moderation for Facebook, they're spending $500 million a year. Decreasing that by 10 or 20% is, is like not, it's, it's, a, it's a real amount of money. And so what, what's the way forward? Well, bridging based ranking is this idea of, can we actually have ranking systems that explicitly reward behavior that bridges divides? Or in the very least ensure that those fomenting divides don't get a significant advantage in ranking. And one example of what that might look like is rewarding content that leads to positive interactions across diverse groups, including around divisive topics. And so I can walk through sort of an example of what that sort of looks like. It's very, very simplified, but it gives you a basic idea. And if you're a computer scientist, you know, I apologize, this is really, really oversimplified. But if you have, let's say, Alice and Bob, they're Green Party members, and they like the Green Party posts, but they might like every once in a while a, a post that, that may be from a blue party. 
um, person. And Oscar and Wendy are in the blue party and, and they're the opposite. Each of those rectangles on the left is a post and you can see their reaction to the posts of the other people and the color of, of those people. And so Igor, well, he's also in the blue party and you can see his feet over there. And under engagement-based ranking, he's gonna see the stuff by default do, do, do the way that collaborative filtering works and so on. And again, lots of caveats here for the computer scientists in the room, um, but, um, but he's gonna see the things from that are sim most similar to him and the stuff that he's, he generally likes, you know, across all the content that he's seen, which is from the blue party. Um, at most, it would be like making fun of the green party. So it's really, you know, it, it's essentially in that same category. Um, and with bridging-based ranking, it's a little bit different. Instead of the content that, um, that is just his color, it's the content that receives positive responses across divides that's shown first. And so sure, you're gonna see that four because it's like the thing that he most wants and it's, you know, it's also the thing that, that an Alice um, who's on the other party would want. But you're also going to see content that might be stuff that Alice likes from her party, but which again, which other blue people have appreciated. And the key point here is this isn't just showing Igor things that, that folks in his party doesn't like. That isn't helpful and it can actually increase polarization. It's showing content which is liked across those divides. And I can talk for hours about all the caveats around this. The problems, the definitions, the approach, the examples, the impacts on democracy, the side effects. No system is perfect. But what this does is at least get at some of those negative impacts of engagement-based ranking. And it can be compared favorably to that status quo for almost all purposes. Bridging has significant net benefit as we're gonna see in some early pilots. And so one example um, that I can talk about publicly is Twitter Birdwatch. And this is a proof of concept that is now being used. And what they do, they're actually using this specifically for misinformation. And it, what Birdwatch does is it lets, user, lets users provide context. So labels on tweets that take into account whether people who rated it seem to come from different perspectives. So they, they sort of, they, you have the, the tweet itself, you've got the context, and then you have like ratings of that context. And they found that people actually like and find helpful the notes that have been rated positively by Birdwatch contributors across the political spectrum. So I would love to share with you some of the other exciting work from other platforms and other organizations. They're not quite public yet. But one major takeaway from this is that it appears that bridging like systems actually dramatically um, reduced content moderation costs, even in those other environments that are more contentious. And so what can we take away from all of this? So there's two sort of connected work streams. There's the actual ranking, and then there's the measurement of it, bridging metrics. And for each, we need to dramatically expand and accelerate development and analysis of these early stage experiments. We need to like, this shouldn't just be little things. They should be, this should be the way that we're actually building these systems from the start. And we need to actually dramatically accelerate the research and development of implementation of this that go into other contexts. So yes, your Facebook newsfeed, yes, your Facebook comments, you know, YouTube feed, YouTube comments, what you see on Chrome when you open it up, like all of these different things, they can all benefit from this. Even like which things should get push notifications versus which, which shouldn't. Would you want the things that are ex exacerbating conflicts or the ones that are actually going to help like mediate and moderate those conflicts? So there's an incredible amount of work here. Um, and it's really important that we actually involve interdisciplinary scholars. Like in order to do this work, I, I can't even count how many fields of research I've had to dig into. And so we need those scholars and practitioners to ensure that those outcomes truly are beneficial to democracy. And that involves a lot more exploration of those fields, measurement, analysis, ethnographic studies. There's a, just a, a, an incredible amount of work to do this really well but anything almost is better than the status quo. So we need governments, platforms, funders, civil society, researchers to direct resources, time, attention toward these goals. There's a huge amount of work to do. 
And I think sort of my question for the audience is like, if this isn't already a top priority, what's preventing it from being that? And how can, how can I help get it in your, in your key objectives, your roadmap, your budget? Um, because that's what I, I see as sort of the next step forward. Um, and so I guess for me, my next steps, there's a policy report on this that's already written. It'll be out in mid-May. Um, there's a technical working paper, maybe up around then or a bit earlier or later. Um, you can reach out if you want to join a potential collaboration or working group. There's a lot to do here. And so the next thing I have to, I'm going to do is introduce the incredible Jeff Allen. Um, hi, Jeff. Uh, so I've known Jeff since around 2018 when he was working on uh, Facebook on pages and integrity. And it was clear instantly that he was one of the good guys. Um, someone on the inside who's fighting to ensure that Facebook was resourcing and supporting its integrity teams and doing the data analysis that's needed to point out the ways that, that the platform could actually support people instead of harming them. Um, he raised the alarm on the troll farm that were reaching 140 million Americans internally. And in that same report, we, we've since learned that he, he identified the largest Christian American groups and African American groups on Facebook were actually troll farms. And he's now continuing that fight outside of Facebook, working across party lines with other former tech employees at the Integrity Institute. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks a lot for inviting me. And so Jeff, um, I wanted to ask you sort of how, like, I guess going in a little more detail, how is your sort of work related to divisiveness and recommendation systems? Where does this all fit into that? Yeah, um, I, actually, there's actually a few different points where, where your sort of thinking here um, has touched uh, various work I've done in the past. Um, so I'm a data scientist by trade. Um, my first data science job was actually at uh, about.com. Uh, so it was actually in the internet publishing world. Um, about.com is very search engine focused. And uh, on the data science team at about.com, um, one of the questions that we constantly got was, how do we get more traffic from Google search? And so, you know, we did a ton of like reverse engineering to Google search and figuring, all right, like here's like easy things to do. Um, and so, you know, framing it, framing this question in terms of what is the incentive structure that the platforms are creating for publishers, for content producers, for, you know, people, anyone who's sort of like trying to get the attention of the public, um, framing it in terms of like, what is the incentive structure that exists there? Um, um, is it just a really useful framing? Because like, people are going to be following that incentive structure. You know, sometimes they are very thoughtfully going to be following that incentive structure because it's how they make money and it's their bottom line. Um, and, and other times maybe they're, you know, maybe just, you know, they're sort of like instinctively following it, right? It's sort of like the influencers who don't quite know how the algorithms work, but they somehow like subconsciously sort of like learn how the algorithms work. Um, um, and they sort of like have like heuristics for it. Um, so, so it's really touched on that a lot of ways. And, you know, it really was that sort of thinking when I brought, that I brought to Facebook of like, what, who is our platform actually rewarding, right? Like what is the incentive structure that our platform is creating? Um, and spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, okay, like let's say you're a content producer and you want to get as much attention on Facebook as possible. You know, what's the easiest pathway to get that attention, right? To like get as much attention as possible. Like what's the easiest pathway to do it? because that is the incentive structure that the platform is creating. And so thinking a lot about that and like, um, you know, what was the sort of rules of the road that the platform is creating for, you know, content producers and publishers and politicians and everyone. Yeah, and I guess sort of, so what, what then resonates with you around the idea, the potential of bridging recommendation systems? Yeah, I think, um, so, so from the point of view of Facebook, right? So like Facebook's, Facebook's mission, like as a former Facebook employee, right? Like I, I, I actually loved the mission. I think Facebook has the best mission statement out of any of the, the, the big platforms. Um, you know, empower people to build community and bring the world closer together, right? Like, like I think that is exactly the sort of thinking that should be going into our social media platforms. Um, now, to what extent is the platform, you know, actually designed just like holistically, like through and through with that sort of thinking built into it? Like, Definitely plenty of, of work to be done there. And so I, I think like this idea of like, uh, you know, building systems that prioritize content that bridges between communities, I think um, it, it's sort of a no brainer that like, obviously like this is the kind of content that Facebook's mission mandates that they prioritize, right? Like, um, you know, if your mission is to build community and bring the work closer together, it's like, 
content that you know strengthens communities by connecting communities you know externally to each other like clearly that is like your a tier content and then like b tier content would be like content that strengthens communities internally you know and then like c tier and d tier content would be like you know entertainment and then stuff that might be harmful to communities so i think like this sort of thinking just like makes a ton of sense and, and it's just naturally what facebook should be thinking about when it comes to creating their system that makes that makes sense. And so I guess what do you see as like the next steps that they should be taking and that maybe other platforms should be taking along these lines and and how this maybe even fits into to sort of the broader ecosystem. But yeah, I guess next steps first. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I think um so so one thing, so so from from being on the inside, right? It's like how did we end up with the systems that we have today? Right. And I think there's like a couple of there's a couple of pathways, right? That's it's that that sort of have landed us here, right? So like one is um like obviously like you know, there's a lot of different metrics that the platform can measure to evaluate their success that are sort of correlated with how many ads are the user seeing, right? So like time spent on the platform is correlated with ads, you know, how much engagement, how many likes, how many posts are they seeing? Um and, and so obviously like from a business point of view, it's like, ah, yes, clearly we should be goaling our, you know, recommender systems on metrics that are correlated with how many ads users are seen. Um, and then, so like, obviously like there's like business incentives here in one way, um, but obviously, but also like not just, cause you're not always thinking about the business incentives when you're at the platforms, you know, you don't really, there's not a lot of like cold calculus internally. That's like, well, we make more money if we do this. So we're going to do this. Like, that's not how, you talk about it when you're at the inside it's like well we want to show content that people like you know and like we have a like button you know so like let's just show people content that gets them to click the like button um there's this sort of like intuitive like ah yes it's obvious to just rank things by engagement and so i think like figuring out how can we break out of that paradigm and be like no it shouldn't be obvious to just rank things by engagement and like what should be more obvious is think about what do you actually want to do with your platform um and then creating like an, an easy sort of framework and system that teams internally can plug into there. So, um, you know, like when it comes to 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 bridging, you know, ranking uh, content according to bridging, it's like, OK, so we're going to be using machine learning systems. Right. So how do we get labels into the machine learning system such that, you know, a one means this content, you know, bridges divides and a zero means it doesn't bridge divides. So we can start building systems that learn this kind of stuff. Um, and then also like, what are the signals, right? Like what, are, what signals does it make sense to put into the machine learning systems um, so that they're actually successful and meaningfully predicting, you know, something real about the content? Yeah, I know there's an incredible amount of work that I guess needs to be done, but also that already has been done around all these things. Like there are ways that we already know how to, how to tell, even like without knowing the actual language of the post, just based off the responses, the ways people react in the network structure, you can get a sense um, you know, across platforms, what whether or not people are, are having a positive interaction with that content in many cases. And so if you can do that, and then you can also through network network structure understand where the dividing lines are and who are the types of people who always seem to interact negatively, well then you can is there's there seems like there's a lot of opportunity here to to then be like, oh, okay, this this content automatically is in the set that um that is actually bridging these implicit divides. And so like that, does that, that feel like a promising direction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, and, and actually like there's, uh, you know, one of the signals I like to point to a lot is, is page rank, um, which is sort of the algorithm that underlies Google. And that's sort of, you know, a domain looks better under, it scores higher under page rank if it has more links pointing to it, um, you know, like in the broader web graph, like if you just crawl the, the web and, you know, it, they didn't think of it like I, I don't really see evidence that they thought of it as sort of like a oh this is a good way to evaluate you know communities that are large and, and communities that are, that are connected together you know their, their sort of thinking behind page rank was like well like every link is sort of a vote in confidence of you know the content at the end of the link and so you know like this is more trusted sources but page rank also sort of inadvertently also measures like okay like you know organizations that sit at the center of a lot of different communities will naturally get a lot of page rank because they'll be getting links from all these various communities that point to them right and so you know uh journalism outfits you know like the ap and reuters that do like that sort of like core fundamental original reporting just like finding the facts um ends up being vital to all sorts of you know downstream news media and so they sort of send at the center of it mm -hmm. um 
so yeah, yeah. so 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 there's a lot of like opportunity i think here to like find you know more meaningful signals right like it's it's also like yeah like if you're just going to look at the content and you're going to try to say like okay is this bridging content or not bridging content and you're going to like try to have a, a natural language processing system right that's like piecing that together like uh it's, it's hard to imagine. and you can, there are benefits to doing that at least in terms of labeling and understanding network structure and all that but but the but there's also really that significant downsides when you have a platform that's used in hundreds of languages right around the world and so like anything that can work cross-lingually is incredibly powerful i wanted to make two other just sort of follow-ups to what you said one of them is about like the idea of people just come in and they it's a natural thing is to optimize for engagement or to give people what they what they like um like what they most directly instinctively reactively like um and i think that that's this really interesting thing that actually even relates to computer science education because the actual definition of the recommender system problem um, as it's taught is predicting what people will like and then providing it to them, what they will instinctively react to. And so th there's this, this almost like this difference. You come out of school, you come out of a PhD, and then you come in and, you're, you, and now ideally you're being told to optimize for some higher level set of metrics. And that isn't the way that, that it's necessarily taught by default. And so there's like a whole shift there that we don't have time to talk about. Um, but I think it's it's really interesting and important. And one, one final thing I want to react to there was what you talked about in terms of um, Google. And I think the other thing that's really interesting about Google is the way that it has these sort of search rater guidelines and these raters who go and like actually rate things. And there's a lot of benefits to that. But even with both of the, the, the good things that you pointed out um, that really come out of that, it's almost like you still want to have this additional bridging layer on top because there's like these things are not mutually exclusive they build on each other and like for our current world there there is no reason why you can't be combining the benefits of all of these approaches in any ranking system yeah I absolutely will, i think like it really it, it also kind of comes down to like what does the platform view as its mission and mandate right so so the google search you know the mission statement of google search is like uh you know make the world's information widely available and useful or something like that and like you know the most important word in that mission statement is actually useful right because like they want to show you content that is useful and so like their quality guidelines are sort of a hundred page definition of what does useful content look like and what does not useful content look like and these are all public um, for people if you want to look at them um yeah. just just for reference i want i'm going to give you like 30 seconds to give one final thought what would you share what would you want to say to regulators or civil society around like next steps here yeah i think um so i think there's there's a lot of space for 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 regulators to have like to play like a really important role here and um i mean like step one is sort of just on the transparency point of view right like the public simply does not have enough information about how these algorithms work to make informed decisions, right? Like experts do experts on the outside don't have enough information to know if these are responsibly designed or not responsibly designed. The platforms could already be largely implementing, you know, bridging recommendations and we would never know, right? Like they could just flip a switch and, and no one on the public would have any sort of ways to know that. Um, so I definitely think like the, there's a lot more thinking to be done on what should we be mandating uh, from the platforms in terms of transparency so that we understand it and we can say like, hey, you're designing it this way and this is wrong, you know, here's a better path forward. We can really hold the platforms accountable. And I'm going to now go back to your your previous point around, and I guess also raises about what, what, like how these decisions are actually made, who is in charge, and that'll be the, the focus of the next phase of this. So thank you so much and we'll see you again in the sort of larger Q&A. One second, I will be sharing the screen. Okay, so give me one second all. So bridging recommendations, maybe they sound like a good idea. But as we said, like, who who should be in charge of that? these recommendation systems are sort of like, almost like defining like zoning rules. They decide what you're most likely to see along the common paths that you travel. And regardless of whether or not it's engagement-based ranking or bridging, there's a question of who can and should actually make those decisions. I strongly believe that engagement-based ranking should not be the default. Bridging is a better candidate. And obviously it's in practice, it's really a combination and you have some engagement and some 
bridging and there's like a weighting factor. We're not going to get into any of those details today. Um, but taking that aside, what are the ways that we can actually have legitimate processes for coming to these outcomes across national boundaries at global scale? And then there's this problem of the practical issue of everyone just disagreeing about what is the right decision to make. They can put platforms into a bind where they might want to just stick with the status quo to avoid backlash, even where their interests align enough that they might otherwise do the, the pro-social thing. This is a kind of problem that platform democracy seeks to address. Brings us to the next section of the session, that question of who decides. So before we talk more about platforms, I'm, I, want you, I want you to appreciate this image. This is the European Parliament hemicycle. It's the room that's normally used for the largest parliamentary assembly elected by direct universal suffrage in the world. But the people in those seats, they are not members of parliament. They're ordinary citizens selected by democratic lottery, by sortition, a sort of stratified random sample based on demographics. And they're paid. They've gone through an intensive process of education. They're developing recommendations that will inform the future of Europe. There are over 20 languages represented. It sounds crazy if you haven't been paying attention to, to what's going on here, but it's real. And these processes for developing recommendations for informing governance have been used around the world, significantly impacting policy from abortion in Ireland to nuclear policy in South Korea. So now let's return to platforms. What are the problems that we're trying to solve, at least from the perspective of those platforms and perhaps for policymakers? So first of all, critical pro-social improvements could be blocked and those common blockers might be potential angry stakeholders acting against customer desires. One second, I just wanna make sure that the screen is correctly being shared. I have no visibility of that. Okay, I'm hoping for the best. Um, please send- I think so. Over. Yes, okay, great. Um, excellent. Um, so, the, yeah, there, so there's two blockers that are often an issue of platform um, and governance, right? You have these angry stakeholders. Maybe, maybe they're like some political powers that don't really want you to do this thing that will help preserve the democracy in that place. Um, you know, you have, you know, examples in, in India in particular of Twitter that might be relevant depending on one's interpretation. Um, you know, a number of other countries, you know, Duterte in the Philippines, um, not to name too many names. Um, and then the other thing is just acting against sort of this sort of cu customer desire, like what we talked about earlier, um, where it's like, oh, it's this, in, the instinctive reaction of the person is clearly what they really, really want, according to the sort of the intuition of, of the platform, let's say recommender systems. And so that's the philosophy the platforms have is this, we're just giving people what they want, even though it may not actually be what they really, really want. Um, not to keep repeating that lyric. Um, um, but, but yeah, so th this is one of the things that really prevents, um, prevents platforms from, from taking actions that actually support um, democracy and even their own sort of alignment of interests. And the other big problem is the decisions that they make are not seen as legitimate and they aren't legitimate. Um, in order to get to legitimacy, you need to actually give voice and agency to the people who are actually involved or impacted by that decision. And you know, the example here, obviously, that we're thinking about is recommendation system design and changes. But you know, the example I give in, in the paper is political ads policy, because um, that was what was salient when I was first writing the, the one page around this to, to platforms two years ago. Um, and there's, there's a whole swath of issues where there are controversial issues where there is blocking, there doesn't necessarily even need to be. Of course, the problem for everyone else is that platform decisions are made by self-interested corporate CEOs, or they're pressured by self-interested politicians who may even just be autocrats who are seeking to keep their hold on power. There's obviously a huge space and need for democracies to step in and support and regulate platforms, but that doesn't mean that sometimes that can't be co-opted and you need balance of power around that. So let's talk now some crazy talk. Um, 
So platform democracy, what do I mean by that? What if, what if we had government of the people, by the people, for the people, except instead of for digital platforms, it was for a physical nation? It sounds crazy, um, to be honest. And, and there are reasons why you should be very, very skeptical. That, I mean, like, I guess just to give an example of one of those reasons, um, I mean, what would I imagine the elections for Facebook, Google, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, you know, whatever, uh, Discord, I don't know, like any of the, like you'd have a trillion elections or referendum to be dominated by extremes. People, most people wouldn't have any idea or really care what was going on. It would just be a, a mess and it wouldn't make any sense. Um, that's why we have representatives, like hopefully like not too many that we need to keep track of and vote on. But what if there was another way to do this whole democracy thing? like a different paradigm that actually works for this platform context and which has been battle tested in much of the world. So so this, here's a sort of a, a little overview of how that might work. And this is basically the type of thing that you saw in the European um, Union Future of Europe slide that, and also a number of these other examples around the world. Highly recommend looking at the OECD material that Claudia um, and her team has put together. We'll hear from her shortly. Um, or at least the, the summary that I put together that's appropriate to platforms um, at platformdemocracy.com. Basic idea is there's an issue that's selected. Let's say, what should a recommendation systems reward? What should our political ads be doing? And you know the people who actually run these, these, these bodies um, or like facilitate them, they, they, they hone in on complex, controversial topics, things that are intractable, things like, you know, abortion, like that was, that, that's a useful thing, nuclear policy, things that get people really, really angry. They work really, really well for these types of bodies. So next step, invitations to attend, they're sent out to a random, a randomly selected people, um, inviting them to participate. And then of those respondents, a group is selected that represents the demographic characteristics of the broader population that's being that's, um, that's doing, that's being part of this process. In this case, maybe the people being impacted by that platform, maybe it's just for a particular country. Um, then the members of this committee, they, they uh, like the people who are brought in that are selected, they're now part of this deliberative body, they're participants and members of this body. And they, you know, talk to experts and stakeholders. Their goal is to ensure, to, to navigate that information landscape with the help of facilitation and sort of tools that they're taught at this initial learning phase and really try to, to make sense of that issue as well as they can. Um, they iterate in small and large groups. There's moderated discussions. They weigh options, they prioritize, they, they develop principles around what the recommendations should even have and then try to judge the recommendations along those principles. They're doing all of that really messy human work of navigating through this option space to figure out what is the best approach. And this isn't just like a crazy idealistic thing, right? And this is also from um, uh, the excellent OECD work. These processes have been used around the world, many, many different domains. They can, they've been shown that they can increase trust in relevant institutions when they're actually executed effectively. Now, I'm not gonna get into this slide and all this terminology today, partly because it's still evolving a bit. But I wanted to at least share briefly to provide some context. The key thing to note is that this idea of platform democracy refers to the general use of democratic processes to include populations impacted by that platform. And then we can also think about platform assemblies, which allow people to actually develop those recommendations. Those are much longer processes. It takes a lot more time to develop recommendations from scratch. And then also platform deliberative votes. Again, the same exact process, but you're just given a set of options to choose from. There's also a whole swath of complementary solutions. So there, there, there's this, these new, I mean, new ish, Polis is actually pretty old, but these new types of, um, of digital governance tools that use actually something that's very similar to bridging recommendations to help identify common ground, to actually help 
do, a, do the same types of things, and they can work with either a representative population or even allow input from everyone and still not sort of devolve into the anarchy we see on social media. They're specifically dissolve, um, designed to navigate policy dilemmas, find common ground across divides. And so Polis here shown is one of the most well-known. And so just as a broad overview, you have this, this sort of platform democracy. And then within those, you can use these platform deliberative, or sorry, representative deliberative bodies, which can either be assemblies or deliberative votes, or you can use these digital governance tools. And all of these are options for how we can move forward. Now, I am delighted to not be able to share any concrete examples of early stage pilots that are being commissioned by platforms as we speak. They are happening. They're not at the stage where they could go on the record yet. What I can say is that multiple pilots are happening now. I hope to be able to share more publicly through my newsletter as things develop. And part of my goal here is just to say like, you need to be able, in order to move forward on this, you need to be able to trust that we can, like the civil society can actually support you in this, in navigating these really, really difficult topics. So if you're a platform that's concerned about such a thing, you know, just get in touch. I, I get the scrutiny that you're under. It makes sense that you can't share stuff, you know, given that level of scrutiny until you actually have a good idea of what you're doing. And so that's sort of what I'm alluding to here. But what I can do is I can share the kinds of information that I've passed on to platforms around actually executing these. So here's an excerpt from one such document, which has kicked off a pilot. You know, it's a much longer document. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'm hoping to provide sort of a general handbook around how to do this for platforms. But this is sort of a first step in that direction, just sort of seeing what is the type of information that's needed to kick off these processes and to get them connected to third party facilitators who can, who can make this happen. And so just thinking, taking a step back, what does this look like? Here's one sort of cynical perspective, but this idea of like, there's all these competing stakeholders and now you can give that policy hot potato to a democratic process, you know, whatever the controversial issue of the day is. And instead of you having to deal with it as a platform, you're getting the people decide and the stakeholders can argue with the people who are making those decisions instead of with you. And some people might say there's an abdication of responsibility, I am totally cool with kings abdicating their thrones in order to give that, that power to democratic processes. Um, and I think the same applies for platforms to a large extent with, with some caveats. And another scenario that you can imagine is you have, again, stakeholders that are attacking you for doing something new. And you know, let's say they weren't, they weren't paying attention, they didn't want to be involved. You as a platform can be like, we use a democratic process to come to this decision. And this is what 80% of those voters who were involved in that shows this make this week, we're very sorry. And of course, what I really care about is what this means for everyone. And I think that moving toward a place where platforms can make decisions democratically is incredibly valuable. It also means that we're gonna have increasing capacity for these new paradigms of democracy that address some of the challenges of our current institutions. There's so many models for how we can do this. Um, I mean, there's a standard one that's been used around the world and there's variants that are being developed as we speak, including the ones that Claudia, that we're gonna hear from has, has been involved in, excuse me. Um, national, local, as remedies for monopoly power, um, you know, as oversight bodies, even for the regulators, so they don't sort of overstep their bounds. The, I mean, you have platforms pooling resources around these, there's just, just many, many options. And so I want us to move from a world where, you know, here's a, a survey, I, it was a great survey from the Knight Foundation. I think it's amazing that they actually, you know, provided the survey questions as a quiz afterwards. So you can sort of see where you fit, but it, it sort of creates this dichotomy. Should social media companies make their own policies or should the government be regulating it? And, and I, I sort of think we need to move away from that. And there's this third way, right? Government, corporations, okay, that's one axis, but what about platform democracy? You know, there's this, this large space of, of alternative approaches and we have to move away from that single, like from that binary um, and sort of places along that binary. So action items here are 
I want to make this happen. I want platforms to be executing on this. I want to be, help support that. Um, they'll probably be forming a working group around this also. Um, please reach out if you want to get in touch. Um, and that will maybe have just a, a platform component and then also a, um, a civil society um, and, and uh, represent, representative deliberative body expert component to it also. I am incredibly excited to see you know, more researchers, civil society orgs, think tanks, policymakers explore these other models. We have our work cut out for us um, and there's like so much stuff to fund and build. And so now I'm gonna bring in Claudia. Um, Claudia has done some incredible work at the OECD with a number of other organizations uh, to highlight this paradigm of democracy. Um, and I'll let her describe it and sort of say a bit, bit more. So um, let's jump right in. And Claudia, can you give some, some quick context on what you do at the OECD um, and, and these other organizations around this, this new paradigm? Yeah, thanks, Aviv, and really thank you for inviting me into this conversation and, and actually opening up some new reflections in this space, because at the OECD, I have been thinking quite deeply about how do we, well, in a way, how do we democratize democracy by, uh, by giving people genuine power and agency to be shaping decisions affecting their lives through representative deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies. Um, so for the past four years, I've been leading this area of work around the future of democracy and innovative citizen participation, um, looking at these new ways in which people are being given a genuinely meaningful voice uh, with these conditions created to be able to grapple with complexity and to, to find common ground um, on these kind of difficult policy issues. So um, you've already alluded to, to some of the work that we've been doing, but uh, with my team, we've created a database of close to 600 examples now of these processes that have been used only by public authorities around the world. Uh, so there's actually much more that has also been initiated by academia and by civil society um, and have done a pretty comprehensive analysis looking at 80 different variables uh, around like what kind of policy issues have they been used for how long have they gone on for at what levels of government in which countries and and so on to paint a pretty in-depth picture actually about this trend and a better understanding about when and how these kinds of processes can actually be effective both in terms of helping to to get to better decisions but also in a way that generates legitimacy which which you were talking about um so so yeah so perhaps i'll leave it there as an introduction and let you ask some more questions yeah, I guess, I mean, can you speak to the extent and impact um, around the world of these bodies? Like what, what excites you the most about all of this? Well, what excites me, it, well, there's a few things. One is that actually seeing the extent of this trend happening all over the place. Uh, so I've been working in this field for about 10 years. And even when I first started establishing this database and trying to collect case studies, I was surprised by how many examples we were able to find that this is actually much more widespread than we thought. And there's a really deep evidence base of, of what works and under what conditions um, can, can and should we be doing this. And I would say that in the past few years, in particular, we've seen an, an even greater explosion of interest um, and use of citizens assemblies, citizens juries and so on to involve people in decision making. The second thing though that excites me is that there's also been an interest and a new trend developing of not just having these one-off ad hoc initiatives which end up being dependent on the political will um, and this move towards institutionalizing deliberative democracy, actually creating new institutions um, that would make deliberative democracy a core part of how we're making our decisions um, today. So seeing it happening in different ways as well and also in different different countries different levels of government um, and the the main interest coming to me these days is is rather from governments wanting to think about how do we actually embed this into our democratic infrastructure rather than just wanting to do a one-off process yeah can you give a any like an example of of that maybe what you've been involved in in paris yeah, so I've been involved in designing some of these institutionalized bodies as well. So the, the one, the most recent one was in Paris. Uh, so the city council um, a couple of years ago now had, it, actually, just to take a step back, because I just want to make it clear, actually, that the demand for this permanent citizens assembly in Paris also came from the people of Paris. So it came out of a one-off citizens convention that 
had been organized by the, the Paris City Council out of the um, out of the kind of protests that initiated this great debate in France and led to all sorts of things happening. And one of the things was the city of Paris asking the people of Paris, a, a representative sample through a Democrat lottery, what they would like. And they, they recommended that they want a permanent body of citizens that are involved in decision making. And so the, the council then convened myself and a group of experts through FIDE, which is another organization that I'm on the board of, which is the Federation for Innovation Democracy in Europe. Um, and so together, we came up with a proposal for, for this new, new permanent body, which is comprised of 100 people who are selected by lottery to be represented of people living in Paris. So not just French citizens, but anybody who's a resident here. So technically even as a Canadian who's, who's living in, in this city, I could be selected to be part of it. Um, so a hundred people, anyone 16 and over who have a one year mandate. Um, and during that year, they have numerous competencies. So one is that they have a role to influence the, the investment priorities through deciding on the theme of the following year's participatory budget, which, which consists of 100 million euros a year so it's actually a pretty significant amount of money um, that they're deciding the the, the so direction just, just of to the jump spending in there on. for a second i think this is yeah. really interesting this is a like i mean if you imagine applying this to platforms this mm -hmm. is like can you actually have a a permanent body which is helping allocate resources within within that platform body like i think platforms might be more hesitant toward that particular thing than versus you know addressing the controversial thing that's getting them attacked on all sides Mm -hmm. But it is a it is a potential future direction to be to be exploring. Um, and I mean, if if we're if it's decided that platforms are monopolies, then there might be consequences for that. And part of that might be have like devolving a little bit of that power also. So it, there's some very, very interesting directions where these sort of permanent bodies can play a part, not just in decision making like around policy and design, but also around resource allocation. Yeah, definitely. And also around other things, because actually the next point I was going to say of the Paris um, Assembly is that they also have an agenda setting rule that they decide on which issue goes to a one off citizens jury every year. And that citizens jury's recommendations go directly in the form of a local bill to the um, to the city council. And they have a, a, um, an obligation to respond to those recommendations within at least six months. Um, so you could also imagine, actually, in the context of a platform, having that agenda setting role because you were raising all sorts of different questions actually about what are the issues that you know could go to a platform assembly actually there could be a permanent form of group of citizens that are rotating so it's not always the same people but um but that actually have that mandate and that even the agenda is set by people as well and to if, some extent and if you can just speak to like like many people hear this and they're like this is still utterly crazy random people can't do this like we can't just have random people running things it doesn't make any sense like how do you respond to that well i respond to that in a few ways one is that like that to believe in this yes you have to have a starting assumption actually that everybody is equally worthy and capable of being involved in shaping the decisions that affect their lives so I believe in this and to believe in deliberative democracy and in these principles means that you, you recognize the fact that all of us actually have this capability and this worthiness and the dignity of being involved in these decisions. And then secondly, we also have evidence from hundreds of examples of around the world in all sorts of different I contexts think that's more that people <laughs> are more than capable. It's about creating the conditions, uh, having enough time, bringing in experts, having information presented in a way that anyone can understand it um, and we have just so much evidence that people can grapple with the most complex issues because I think also sometimes we um, I say we kind of because I'm always talking to policymakers, but we think that all of these things are just way too technical. Uh, but actually, a lot of technical issues are are rather rooted in values driven dilemmas, and that means that they concern everybody, and everybody in society has an equally important role in shaping those decisions. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so we're going to um, now move to open Q&A. One second, let me, um, I will go back to sharing for a second here. Um, 
Yes. So if you have to hop on the hour, um, thank you so much for joining. Um, this will all be recorded. And as I said, reference material is linked um, uh, from, uh, from the, that, that newsletter. We just put out all the links in one place. Um, you know, put questions in the Zoom Q&A, put comments in the chat. Um, and I just sort of put back up that those sort of takeaways that sort of try to bring together everything that, that we've been talking about today. Um, and we have, um, we've got a question um, here around what, what would a, why would a platform actually adopt one of these processes? Um, what are the incentives? And I mean, I guess, I think it'd be interesting, Claudia, just to hear about it from your perspective, from why do governments do it? Um, and like maybe how much of that translates into what platforms do or might want to do? Yeah, well, I think it's, I think it's a similar set of, of reasonings and rationale for why, why do this in the first place. And usually why governments do it is because they have a hard problem and no matter what they do, somebody's going to be pissed off or not happy exactly with that decision and you can't make everybody happy and there's all sorts of trade-offs to consider in in the decision you need to make um, and so usually the, these are the sorts of issues on which they're blocked on and no action is happening um, and so creating the conditions to bring together a broadly representative group of people give them the time and the resources to better understand the complexity of it, the trade-offs, hear from experts, hear from stakeholders, so that the stakeholders also feel like they've had a chance to, to have a say. Um, and yeah, create the conditions for them to, to have to come to some sort of common ground on what should be the way forward on it. Um, and I can see that with platforms, there's all sorts of issues that they've clearly been stuck on. And also the second related issue, which you did mention, Aviv, is, is related to legitimacy, both the actual legitimacy and the perceived legitimacy around taking these decisions. So having this sort of process in place um, helps them to garner this. Yeah, um, I don't know, Jeff, if you want to add to that, having been in the belly of the beast. Yeah, I think um, it'd be interesting to see like like platform reactions to it and like where are they happy to adopt this and where are they not happy to adopt this? I know, um, you know, when it comes to like, like, wow, what was the thinking behind the oversight board and, and you know, sort of like the, the, the actual root issue and thinking that went into the oversight board was, there's a lot of like content focused of like, how do you define good content? How do you define bad content that, you know, Facebook leadership is like, we don't particularly care about like getting into the nitty gritty details and constantly having a conversation and constantly having a battle about it. Like, um, you know, sort of the definition of like, what is good content and what is bad content is, I almost think of it as like a fractal sort of debate where it's like, the more you zoom in on good content, you see like, oh, well, actually there's a subset of this good content that is actually bad content. And then you zoom in on that and you're like, oh, well, actually there's a subset of good content within this little bad content. And so, um, you know, there is this sort of debate that the platform is probably happy to say like, look, like we don't really care at the end of the day. Like we, we just want to build the platform. We want to build the databases. We want to build, you know, um, and so we're happy to like outsource this, outsource this debate of like, what is good content? What is bad content? Um, I think where you might hit a little bit of friction is, is sort of where it does come into to like, okay, well, like now that we know what is good content and now we know what is bad content, you know, we will now take over, right? Like, like how we, you know, the systems that we build and how we go about, you know, amplifying the good content. Um, I could definitely see that where, you know, they, they, they want the groundwork, you know, they're happy to outsource, like what is the lay of the land that all companies have to obey? But then, you know, how they go about optimizing their own behavior, you know, within that framework is probably something where they would like more autonomy. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. And, and I think what's really interesting with the way you, you bring it up is, um, is this almost like this legislative executive divide in many ways? Um, and I think that actually is like a really, really valuable model for what this can bring. This doesn't mean that you can't use these paradigms to, to support executive functioning because you can. And judicial, like they're they're you know Claudia and, and I can talk your ear off about that. Um, uh, but within the platform context, like having that legislature that you can hand stuff over to, um, that will actually like consider not just like the different stakeholder perspectives, but even the lived experiences of what it's like to to be someone in those different countries in those different environments. Like that's in, in incredibly valuable to to have people be sharing those experiences across their languages. Um, and then coming to, to coming to common ground. 
And I think that actually gets to one of the next, um, the next questions here, um, which is um, how does this form of deliberative democracy take into consideration competing equities? Is there a form of consensus building nearing the end of, the, of a process? And I think Claudia, I'll, I'll hand that one to you. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm not sure entirely in what way the point about competing equities is meant, because I think there's one or two different interpretations, but I'll start with the second part of, of the question. And maybe if uh, the person who put it in wants to write like a small addition to explain what, what is meant by that, I can go back to that. But um, but yeah, the point of, of these processes is to, to try and reach consensus and common ground. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody will 100% agree with everything, because that's usually not possible, and I would say not even desirable if we value pluralism and a democracy as well. But the aim is rather to get to the point at which the vast majority, and usually in these processes, the threshold is like 75 or 80%, will agree with the recommendations that they're putting forth collectively. So that might not be okay, I agree fully, but I can live with this and I'm happy to get behind it. And because I've really understood the rationale and the reasoning for the people who hold a different point of view and are coming at this from a different uh, perspective from me, um, it's actually really possible to reach that high level of, of, um, of consensus around the, the recommendations. So, I mean, there's different approaches that are taken in different countries and depending on the different models of these things. But I would say the dominant approach is not to resort to voting but to actually try and find consensus in the group. And it's, and it's one of the main differences to more participatory approaches of engaging people too, which tend to aggregate people's individual views rather than the harder work of trying to understand where each other is coming from and see where can we actually find some, some middle ground and some common ground around things, which I think also adds legitimacy and gives value to policymakers too, or decision makers more broadly here. Um, and then, yeah, the point about, about uh, competing equities, um, direct political responsibility. Um, yeah, so this is why, this is why the, the process actually of having a democratic lottery really matters. And it's not just like a technical thing, but actually for the democratic aspect of it, it makes a big difference. Um, because when you bring in people through a lottery process, their only motivation is to come to a decision that actually serves the, the community. Um, so in the processes that are being used for, for government and for public decision making, like in the very first session, usually the first thing people are told, you know, we're really grateful you're here and giving your time, but you're not here to give your own individual opinion on something. You're here to put yourself in other people's shoes, to also represent the community more widely and to try and find common ground. Um, and so this, puts people into a completely different kind of perspective of how they're there, um, but also because they're not there to represent the company they work for, the political party they're part of, the organization they might support, they're just there as everyone coming into it from the community. There's a very different logic to how they participate. And also none of them are going to try to be reelected afterwards. So they don't care about campaign financing or what their party might think about their decision or um, about you know, upsetting voters because that's not the, the, the kind of incentive structure around the decision-making as well. Um, yeah. I guess like one thing um, I think I would love to hear a lot of your perspective on is the challenges of actually getting over that hump with policymakers um, where they're like, oh yeah, maybe we've got other things on our plate, right? Like, we're like, we don't, we, we're not really sure this is a good idea. Um, and like maybe the analogs um, that you might have, have here, like what, what, what is sort of like helped get over that 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 sort of obstacle um, and, and really actually embed the values that you're bringing into this, into that process, as opposed to being something that's just being controlled by the policymakers, which is theoretically mm. possible um, if, if you don't have good enough accountability organizations, which, by the way, need to be need are being created by amazing people um, in this network. And we need we need a lot more of that um, that sort of help create that sort of baseline and standards around mm. the way these these systems are are constructed. Um, so yeah I'm, yeah, I'm curious about getting over that hump. 
Yeah, no, indeed. But I mean, I think to me, this goes back to why the starting point is a problem that needs to be solved as well. It's not like it's not like we're wanting to do this for the sake of doing an innovative process or even I mean, I, I do think the intrinsic democratic motivation should be part of it, too, but I don't think it always is the, yeah. the main thing driving things. But the, the, main pro, the, the main thing is is problem solving. And I mean, I think there's a lot of problems that you mentioned already that platforms are facing and don't seem to actually have the answers on um, to do with hate speech and harassment and certain types of angry content, uh, you know, being up in the feeds and that's also creating incentives for what kind of content should be produced. You know, these are these are real problems that need solving. And it doesn't seem to me like the solutions are coming from within these organizations or from elites who have other kinds of incentives around uh, this as well. And also not everything can be down to regulation, even though I think obviously regulation does play an important role in, in some of the decisions around this. And actually, I think citizens should be playing a role in what kind of regulation is needed as well. And there's a really interesting example that's been going on in Canada, actually. Um, there's a series of three national level citizens assemblies on uh, democratic expression um, related to issues around regulating the big platforms, hate speech online, harassment, and all sorts of, of things too. So worth looking into actually about what's what's been happening there. Yeah, and those are, those are very broad in general, and they're still, I would say the the outputs are, are comparable to what you get from like a think tank um, uh, in terms of like like they they're they are really um, you know in terms of quality you mean yeah in terms of the yeah. quality um, uh, it's not it's it like it may not be what you would expect from a you know a random set of citizens um, but um, but they I get at some a lot more than you <laughs> than many of than many they get they get at more nuance and more of the more of the tensions. Um, then you might actually see it at, let's say, a think tank that might have a particular political orientation. Um, either yeah, and actually, right. that goes to another point in the sense that because of the fact that the lottery process brings in a much greater diversity of people that are involved in any decision making that usually happens, that in itself actually tends to lead to better kinds of decisions. And there's a huge field of research in psychology and business and political science, which actually shows the benefits of collective intelligence leading to better decisions than those taken by more homogeneous groups like experts. I guess one more thing riffing on that is one of the questions that I sometimes get is, why wouldn't we just use a multi-stakeholder expert body um, to help make these decisions? And the answer is, yes, you should be talking to multi-stakeholder expert bodies. Um, uh, and, um, and there's, and I mean, I guess I'd like to, let me, let me pass this over to you, Claudia, first, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of add to that and then we'll, then we'll close. Um, I feel like Jeff is also your... dying to get in here, so we'll let him. Oh, no, Jeff, yeah, 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 where were you asking, Jeff? Jump in. Oh, I mean, I was just gonna say like, it's it's, you know, in a lot of ways, like the big platforms and the conversation, the way the conversation plays out of the big platforms is also a little bit like, you know, how policy gets made, you know, at sort of like the current sort of like congressional, right, like level where, you know, there's a whole lot of different bodies who have like have a stake in like the outcome and then they lobby, right? And, you know, there's, there's internal teams that lobby leadership to make a particular decision when you're at the company. Um, there's external parties. So advertisers actually like, you know, advertisers actually have a huge influence on, you know, what the content moderation standards are, um, obviously, mm -hmm. because like, they don't want their ads next to certain types of content, and they're not going to put their ads next to certain types of content. And that is a really great way to get platforms to make decisions about that. Um, and then you also have sort of like the companies want to avoid, you know, sort of like PR fires. And so, you know, they want to keep, you know, loud, you know, influential voices externally, like also happy. And so, you know, the current state of affairs is really sort of this um, messy, organic, you know, play, right, for, for influence and, and like how these decisions get made. Um, mm. And so there's probably a lot of overlap, right, in terms of like what do traditional legislative bodies look like and how do the decisions get made there of like a little bit of expertise, a little bit of lobbying, a little bit of money, a little bit of like something else all kind of like stirred together in the pot. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, going going back to something you said earlier, Jeff, which kind of made me think about like, hmm, because 
in your earlier remarks, like during your like fireside chat, you were saying like you were talking about mission statements and how you felt like Facebook's mission statement around, I don't know if it's something around community and empowerment or things like this. But then like if that's truly their mission, then like they also do need to care about all these problems. And they actually can't say like, oh, well, you know, the moderation stuff, like, you know, we create the general framework, but then the details, whatever, like that doesn't really align with the mission in, in my view. So it's also a bit challenging them. Like, do, do you really believe in this mission or like, like there's one thing to say it and another thing to like in the way you actually operate, how you're taking decisions, what you're doing about this. Um, are you are you living up to it? And I think they feel the same kind of disillusionment, uh, like the, they feel the public disillusionment in them the same way governments are feeling the public disillusionment and distrust in them as well. So, um, so I think those broader meta kind of things might also be maybe not the dominant factor, but I think at least for some of the decision makers, I would like to think might be part of of, of the considerations. But going to 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 the question you were asking as well, Aviv. I mean, one thing that I did reflect on before this conversation and wanted to bring in as well though is you know how to how to ensure that like if if these platforms are actually setting up uh, platform assemblies or even platform deliberative votes that these are not being done in just a technocratic way and that they're actually genuinely democratic um, and also in terms of what then is the commitment to those recommendations that come out of such an assembly, for instance. And this is the same challenge that is currently talked about and really present in the field of government and politics too, where all these assemblies are happening, um, but the recommendations are not always being implemented. And that ideal or the good practice principle as we have in the OECD guidelines of, of uh, providing a rationale for at least why not, it's not always being met. Um, and actually there was a new academic paper that came out just two, three days ago, which showed that actually when you do such a thing, if you set up an assembly and then not follow through on its recommendations, it actually fuels greater public disillusionment in government. So there's also a risk, I think, with platforms if they if they set up these assemblies, but then they don't actually act on the recommendations too. So I think that there's like a balance to be had about convincing them and overcoming their perhaps their sense of risk, which I don't think they should see it as a risk, because if you really believe in people and trust them and you create the right conditions, it shouldn't be risky. But um, but I think I think that there needs to be actually a commitment to really taking taking it seriously and also having designed into all of this thinking some form of accountability mechanism, because at the moment in the field of, of government, if a, if a government ignores the recommendations, nothing happens. It's like they do it with impunity. Um, and so how do how, and these are some of the design challenges I'm thinking about in that context, but I think it's important to be thinking about that here if we're wanting to bring these sorts of democratic processes and institutions into into governing platforms, which I which I really do think we should be doing. Yeah, and I just want to like close, like add to that little bit, which is they have found that there still are very I mean there are strong benefits in terms of trust in those institutions. Um, uh, when they, the recommendations are considered, when they are taken seriously, when they are responded to. Um, it's only when you completely ignore it or you try to mess with the process that you get into trouble. That, that was my, my read of, of, that, of that literature. Um, and so I think, um, I mean, it comes from, I mean, it, I guess it's also helpful if you have nothing to lose as a platform because mm -hmm. you know you're gonna be regulated otherwise, um, then, then there, there is real, real upside, I think, to, to being like, okay, like let's let's actually bring in all the stakeholders instead of just having this one set of stakeholders who is deciding things. And maybe through that process, everyone will actually learn more about this, including us, about all their, these risks, and it'll support the next steps. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, I know Jeff has to hop, um, and Claudia, you're welcome to to leave. Also, I'm gonna uh, I'll, I will stick around um, uh, if folks want to to ask questions. Um, and um, yeah, I'll I'll be here for for a little bit longer. But thank you, thank you all so much for um, thanks, Jeff, for being a yeah, part of this. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I I can also stick around a little bit because I had planned uh, yeah just another maybe five ten minutes or so, even though it's quite late here. But <laughs> um, yeah. And I'm gonna stop recording. Okay. <laughs>